<laughs> Can we get the next slide, Sonia? Thank you. Yeah, so as um, you have heard, um, Reckonings is indeed an innovative program of collaboration and it has um, lots of ambition for collaboration with community partners. We have been fortunate, um, the four PIs from whom you are hearing in particular today, to receive a planning grant from the Mellon Foundation. Um, and really that planning grant is in order to instantiate uh, more of a service learning for the humanities, at, in particular at the intersections of the public and the digital humanities. And I just say personally in that context, um, you will also see that all four of us in that context are working in particular on collaborations in the Boston and New England region. We'll ultimately talk more about our ambitions as well. But this focus on Boston and the New England region, and we have with Dr. Baumgart now, of course, a very deep um, um, expert there. We have with, we have um, collaborators um, who have been, you know, in the orbit of the project, such as Nicole Aljo and um, Regine John Charles, who have deep traditions of working in um, community engaged ways in the Boston region. And then we have some of us who are learning a lot more about Boston in this context. I was trained as both an Americanist and a Europeanist, and a number of you have probably heard me say how struck I was when we did the racial literacy series. Um, and I often quote, still quote Patricia Davis, when she introduced that um, event on history there, she basically gave this very quick anecdote that I think illustrates very well why we need uh, new ways of making history at this point. What Patricia said, when she uh, moved from Atlanta to Boston, she said that all of her white friends said, ah, cool Boston. And all of her black friends said, why would you ever want to move there? And I would just say that for me, it's been very striking that many white people in Boston don't even know why that question would be asked. And at the same time, I think what is also very striking and so much part of reckonings is that certainly um, difficult histories need to be highlighted. But histories that are exclusively focusing on victimization go only so far and in fact reinscribe um, power differentials in ways that can be very um, problematic. So what we are also about is trying to think through how to have um, more complex histories, histories that also um, show um, the circumscribed ways of agency and empowerment for BIPOC communities. And uh, over to you, or Dr. Nieves, over to you. So one of the things that um, has been also key in this work has been um, moving at the seed of trust, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, really important. We didn't come up with that phrase. Uh, colleagues um, who out of Mellon and working on several projects with Mellon have come, come up with this phrase. And it really is uh, about developing trust, which does take an awful lot of time. Um, there's lots of iteration and co-creation is really a kind of framework that we're working to develop, but it has, as, as you can imagine, really um, some challenges, but it's also becoming the norm in the humanities. And for it to become the norm in the humanities, we actually have to figure out how to practice it. Um, and it's got it not only its challenges, but it's got many of its rewards. One of the things um, Mellon sort of tasked us with, did task us with, is to think beyond the nine or 14 week semester as sort of the way to measure projects and, and to think beyond the sort of extractive model that has long been the practice of so many, not just in the humanities, but in the social sciences. And to think of what does a long-term investment work, working in community kind of mean, right? What does it mean to actually develop a partnership, not a top down, but actually a partnership that means, you know, lots of conversation, developing lots of trust and making mistakes, and being honest about the mistakes that happen along the way, and really teaching students what that kind of a partnership means. And being a little bit vulnerable in the classroom with your students. And the other thing Mellon really challenged us to do was to also think differently about the funding model that we have and have had, and to provide funding for our collaborators because they are doing labor when they work with us in these projects. And that requires a little bit of thinking differently um, and requires us to think about the kind of compensation that we provide. So for example, when we do oral history work, it isn't free. 
we need to pay them for their time when they sit down and do that oral history work. And, and we can talk more about you know, ways of thinking about that. Um, and the other thing that Mellon tasked us with, or they sort of tasked themselves with and us, is to also think differently about the way program officers work. So they are actually, uh, their sort of four program areas are coming together to think with us about the ways in which they can bring together their, their sort of four streams of funding to actually bring their resources together in the next ask that we're going to make for this implementation. So they grow to pool their resources together, which is something they typically don't do. Usually you end up working with one program officer on a particular stream of funding. And here they're trying to think a little bit differently, a little bit creatively about what happens when program officers actually work across and together with one group to see you know, how that might work. And, and they're scratching their heads a little bit about how that works. I think pretty easy to just put the numbers together. But um, we're going to see how this all um, uh, sort of plays out. And, and it's not just financial. It's also about the programmatic connections from other projects that they have going on as well. And, and the resources that might potentially come together. So I'm going to let the uh, Dean of the Library and Vice Provost for Information and Collaboration uh, come up and tell you, Dr. Hanfong. Thank you, Dr. Nanos. Um, uh, and I think you've just started to touch on some of the challenges um, that, that I think we face in this project. Um, you know, I, I think that the Mellon Foundation and a um, number of grantees right now are, are really thinking through some of these very difficult questions of collaboration. Um, I'll, I'll put my vice provost hat on with my very title, vice provost for information collaboration. Um, right now, the, you know, I think collaboration is just really hard. Even the people in this room, we know each other and our academics or librarians and archivists and professionals and other ways in the realm of cultural heritage. Um, even within this room, it's hard to collaborate. And then you think about collaborating with communities it gets to be incredibly hard for a number of different reasons. Um, before I was here at Northeastern, I was executive director of the Digital Public Library of America, which brought together the aggregated digitized collections of a few thousand um, cultural heritage sites and libraries, museums, archives. And even within that project, there was a lot of questions around the agency of local communities, the materials that they had, what was being digitized, who was having access to those materials, um, everything from just the structure of where things are held. So we had, there was a sister project in Europe called Europeana, and everything was held centrally at The Hague. And that just wouldn't work for us here in the United States for a lot of reasons. Um, and we ended up with more of a federated hub and spoke model. Um, questions about what the uses, the proper uses of these materials are is, is one of those. Big, big, big questions. I think that um, part of what I've learned, not only at DPLA, but here at Northeastern and working with my colleague Verdana in Archives and Special Collections is that the community may have uses for Archives and Special Collections that are unanticipated or that differ significantly from what scholars would like to do with those same materials. And, um, and that's complicated. Um, the kinds of things that we might like to collect and preserve and present again, might be different. So I think these questions about, you know, collaboration sounds nice. Um, it sounds like it would be at least um, manageable in practice um, or in theory, but in practice, it actually involves people with very different goals, um, very different um, frameworks for how they understand the materials that they're working with. Um, and so I think what I'm excited about with Reckonings is just trying to continue to think through, again, with other, um, with the program officers at Mellon, with other projects that are going on right now, uh, exactly how one squares um, or combines I think, the agency of the community, the resources of the community, and what we do here and the resources and, and work that we do here um, in the academy and in the library. Um, I also mentioned that we um, there are within you, this university um, sister project of the Boston Research Center, which has been going on since 2018, um, also funded by the Mellon Foundation. We just received an additional half million dollars of funding for a third phase of the Boston Research Center. And that is also involving direct work with the community in various neighborhoods to preserve and present 
um, again, in co-creation with the community, um, as well as with the Boston Public Library, which is maybe something we can talk about later, but um, something I'm really excited about, and I think that Nolan is excited about uh, with Reckonings Boston Research Center is, who do we pick as partners? Who are the community institutions? And, and public library, having a strong public library in Boston with branch libraries across the city as one of our partners for the Boston Research Center, um, I think has been a very interesting learning experience of how a research library might work with a public library to, um, to help uh, you know, be a good partner with the university um, as well. Um, one of the key things I think that we're all aiming to do is to try to um, not reinvent the wheel. Um, I think that if you look at digital projects over time, um, we tend to do the same thing over and over and not um, take a set of tools or build a set of tools or workflows or processes that we can use um, again in a replicable way. And so I think this is a project where we'll, we have some incredible pilots going on right now that hopefully we can then um, move into other areas, other neighborhoods, other cities, and so forth. So I think there's a, a lot of exciting things. I'm excited to be a small part of this, um, again, with the library as a partner. Um, and I think there'll be some great service learning and then learning as well for how we can be better collaborators um, with community partners. So I think I'm going to pass it back to Dr. Nieves. Thank you, Dr. Um, one of the things you might be wondering is what are going to be some of the outcomes um, in this work? And so one of the things we are working very hard uh, to figure out is how do we create toolkits? And we have this concept of toolkits, and it's really around the knowledge that community members are already making, already doing, because they have already been doing the work of understanding, marking, and organizing their heritage in particular kinds of ways. And I think Dr. Brown Gardner raised earlier the Black Heritage Trail in New England, for example. They've been working with her on this heritage markers project. And they've been working pretty steadily on figuring out ways to do that. And that knowledge, um, that sort of knowledge work that they have should be documented in some way because there's a process there that's happening. And then we think there's a toolkit that comes from that knowledge and that toolkit needs to be leveraged for other communities. I mean, again, as Dr. Cohen said, why read them the wheel when there's already work been done? So the toolkit becomes something that we provide both online and in an analog format so that it can be used online for other communities and for those who have access issues, it can be, uh, it can be accessed through a PDF and we can also make these available in community centers at institutions um, in the community and make that part of what um, is, is you know, one of those products. Um, you know, the other thing, and, and I have to say, um, this wouldn't be possible uh, without, uh, next slide, without uh, our, oops, oh, back one maybe? Nope, okay, okay. Um, wouldn't it be possible um, without uh, Gijo Azaglo, our community partnerships coordinator, who is here in the room. Um, she is a Ghanaian sound and performance artist from the local community. And she comes to us because of this work. Um, she really was instrumental in co-creating. And also Greg Lord, our project manager and director of design, who we managed to lure away from his work with NASA. And he's someone who's got almost two decades of experience in digital humanities work. And we're really, really fortunate to have two superstars working with us and helping us think this through. And there's a little bit more to G. Joe's story, which I'll mm -hmm. um, say in a bit, but I think I'm now gonna pass it back over to um, Dr. Poiger. Thank you. I think we're struggling slightly with our PowerPoint, but could we just um, try to flip through a little bit more here, um, a little further? It's a fear, it's very strange. In any case, um, there was a, in an earlier time, there was a beautiful slide that at the last minute disappeared that had all the names of all of the research assistants from Northeastern who have worked on the project thus far. And there's about 14 of you, some of you in the room, some of you online. And we couldn't be doing the work without um, the um, patients and also important work that our 
um, research um, assistants um, have done. And they have really been with us on this journey of um, co-creation and um, of um, learning together what responsible engagement means. Also learning together that, um, that often moving at the speed of trust means um, twists and turns that one doesn't um, expect. And um, that the needs of every single one of our partners, and we can maybe just go back to the partners page um, again, Tanya, that every single one of our partners has actually there is the same need. So a big shout out to all of you who from sociology, history, English, um, international affairs, um, undergraduates and graduate students, masters and PhD students, and as well as PhD candidates who have joined us on this journey. Really, really important to have you as collaborators and you are doing amazing work. I then turn it back to Kabria. Okay, next one. All right, so one of our pilot programs is um, unboxing the archive. And uh, it's a digital storytelling video project that explores the rich history of African-Americans in New England from the 18th century to about the mid 20th century. And so we use archival collections at historical societies, libraries, and cultural organizations to create 10 minute videos. Um, and these videos feature uh, fascinating, often overlooked uh, stories on a range of topics from slavery in Essex County, Massachusetts, to um, successful Black entrepreneurs in the early 20th century. Um, so I want to say a little bit about how I came to this project and why it seems to be a great fit for um, the Reckonings program. Um, so I'm a historian of the African American experience, uh, late 18th, early 19th century, um, in this region, um, New England. Um, and I often visit historical societies, um, organizations, libraries, archives, usually collecting material that's related to a book project or to an article. Um, so I go in with a purpose. And, um, but even as I go in with a purpose, there's still really fascinating stories to be told um, in those collections that don't relate to my book, that don't relate to my article. And so I thought, wouldn't it be a fun opportunity for students, particularly students in my African American history course, if they had a chance to look at these documents and possibly to tell a story using these documents? Right, it's a kind of different way of learning African American history. And a lot of the students that I worked with had grown tired of right, textbooks, right? They want to actually work with the primary sources. So, what if we unbox the content of an archival box? What kind of stories emerge? So this project has taken shape over the last couple of years. Um, undergraduate and graduate students put a lot of time and effort into creating these videos. They visit libraries um, that hold these materials. They read secondary sources um, to understand the context and they learn digital skills. So it's a, it's a good experience for them. Um, and I just wanted to give you a very specific example if we have a little bit of time. Um, so this summer, we had a team of about six students, um, undergraduate and graduate students, and they had an option of what topic they wanted to explore. So one of our students, um, Alyssa Machajewski, she's a second year MA student in public history. She has a background mm -hmm. in anthropology, and she was very interested in exploring the story of Lucy Foster. Uh, Lucy Foster was an enslaved African-American woman from Andover who gained her freedom during the Revolutionary War. And so I just want to read a little excerpt from um, Alyssa's video script because I think it's very evocative, it's very good, and it's kind of, this is the work that we, you know, that we want to do um, in unboxing the archive and reckoning smart boxes. So imagine that there are images on the screen that will pull you into this history. Sometime before 1771, a young black girl named Lucy made the 25 mile journey from Boston to the town of Andover, Massachusetts. She would work for her enslavers up until their death. Eventually, she would own an acre of land, a house, and an impressive collection of pottery 
the remains of which lay undisturbed for almost 100 years. The archaeological site where her house once stood represents one of the first studies of African American archaeology and provides insight into the material culture of Black New Englanders during the early 1800s. While many details of Lucy's life, such as her family, her friends, and how she spent her time, were left undocumented, Andover Record and the archaeological site provide points of reference for portraits, however partial, of a life spent building freedom out of the rocky New England soil. So I think this is a beautiful opening. I cannot take credit for this. Um, this is all Alyssa, um, her background, her knowledge about archaeology, and then what she learned and what she read about Lucy Foster. And we're very um, much about citing and citing Black women in particular. So um, Whitney Battle Baptiste did work on this archaeological site. She's a Black women archaeologist, so she's someone who is cited um, for her work that Alyssa read. So we're walking in Lucy's footsteps, right? When we're watching this video and when we're hearing Alyssa's narration, I especially feel a little bit of the unease and trepidation. I can only imagine what it's like seeing this little girl being moved from place to place, being forced to labor, um, to not have that freedom. And we won't really know what it was like. We can't only really imagine. Um, but we know that there were thousands of black girls like Lucy who were enslaved in 18th century North America. And this is an important site because it is one of the first studies of African American archaeology. So we know that in the very beginning of the, of the video. Alyssa reminds us that we also don't always have traditional historical documents like a letter or a diary. So in this case, we have pottery, we have plates, we have a vase, and so on. And so Alyssa is able to make this point about the significance of the Lucy Foster home site, showing her building freedom. So the rest of the video unfolds with these images of um, the pottery of the archaeological site. Um, Alyssa went to Andover, right, took photos. Um, there was a, a recent dedication to Lucy Foster's grave site um, that was planned by some high school students. So Alyssa took photos of Lucy Foster's grave site. So all of that is in, is in the video. And our intention here is to uh, show that to our view viewers so they can see these documents, so they can see this material. Um, and we also make sure that our videos are revised, edited, and historically sound. Accuracy is paramount. But our intention is to capture African American history, but also represent the kind of knowledge exchange. Right? We have students working with faculty, working with archivists, working with community partners. And so, as I mentioned earlier, our community partners include um, Black Heritage Hill in New Hampshire, Old North Church, but also some smaller historical societies like um, Historic Society. So I will pass the mic to Dr. Newton. Thank you, we're pressed for time. I'm going to try to keep this brief. I um, want to mention uh, the Black Artists of Boston Project. And I'm going to have to shout out my co-conspirator in the room, uh, Doreen Lee, uh, who made this uh, possible. Uh, so Chelsea Lauder from the Office of City and Community Engagement, uh, who was another co-conspirator, um, introduced me to GJO. Uh, we wouldn't be working with GJO if it wasn't for Chelsea, who uh, made the introductions. And GJO comes from the community and has been many years of performance artist and a member of this community. And she introduced us to the eight elders in which we worked on this project. So she helped us identify the eight elders that we then worked with with our 15 students. And we worked very cautiously and carefully to pair up our students with the elders. And they built relationships with the elders that still exist today, actually. Uh, which is pretty phenomenal. I still get emails from the students and we get emails from the elders. Uh, and it's been a long process to get this web presence up from the elders of the elders online. One of the things we promised the elders was that we would get a web presence with a brief biographical statement online. And that was the only thing we promised we would get up online because it was all about negotiation and they were very careful and purposeful about what web representation they would have online. 
So it was really all about that negotiation. And interestingly enough, they wouldn't sign any permissions. They wouldn't give over any of the rights to the images of their artwork. And we did negotiate for a while and we had a, you know, an agreement sort of going back and forth in a Google Doc for a while. And finally they said, we really don't want to do that. We, we trust you, our agreement is with you. And so it was very interesting to have that kind of process unfold. And this is really the kind of process that Mellon is, is funding, is, is supporting, and, and is really trying to figure out what does that sort of mean for moving forward with these projects and community engagement? How does that sort of vibe with, you know, uh, decades of work that we have all sort of learned very different? And, and, and how do we sort of mark this? How do we sort of move forward in this kind of a process? Um, and, and I would say that the students um, are very much engaged with the elders throughout the course. And one of the things they also were working on is some kind of project that they decided with the elders to work on, that they worked with the elders on. So it was totally up to the elders and the students to figure that out. We didn't sort of come to them with a platform or some preconceived sort of cooked product and said, this is what you're gonna use. It was completely up to the elders. So things from YouTube to uh, Instagram to <laughs> using Scalar to whatever it is that they really were comfortable with or already using, that's what they use to sort of ramp up. And so links to those web presence will be part of what we've provided. And so we're gonna build on this um, in the spring. We're gonna teach the class again. Doreen has graciously uh, agreed to go again uh, on this journey. And, and that's gonna be a long-term commitment, actually a long-term commitment on the part of the public history program. So this is gonna be one of our sort of premier projects for the program. And, and we're gonna keep uh, building on this because right now there's no place to find black artists of Boston in one central location. It is very hard to find black artists online, which is, in, which is an interesting conundrum to have. And, and why can't we find that? And what's also come out is that there's a black artist movement that isn't very well documented. And these were the pioneers of that movement. So there's a history here that needs to be told. And we're going to be working on that. Um, I think the last other thing I was going to mention was we're also um, doing some interesting work in our courses. Maybe um, the course slide in here. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe if we go forward. Yeah. yeah. That's right. It's it's elusive. There it is. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, it is, um, uh, we're working, we have several courses, future and current that are working in partnership with um, uh, institutions in the Boston area. And I'm currently working also with the West End Museum on a series of walking tours that they have wanted to revamp and have sort of very much uh, framed out around issues of social justice and intersectionality. And so my class is working on those with that. And I think Uda is going to wrap us up, Dr. Thank you. Um, I don't think that's quite right because each of us is um, still saying something oh, about yes, the future, right. isn't that Sorry. right? In any case, um, so I definitely want to just stress what um, Cabria and um, and Angel demonstrated, Dr. Baumgartner and Nieves, which is that this this intertwining of the work with the classroom. I think it's something that some others like um, Nicole Aljo and Regine Jean Charles have certainly done before. Um, uh, Regine is doing it currently with the um, Haitian women's organization, AFAB, um, in a course that's running right now. At the same time, I think also what um, reckonings us and affords is a more sustainable model. But there are still big questions when we hear what um, Dr. Nieves just described um, about um, you know, the level of trust and also the level of sustainability of these um, efforts. And there are certainly some spirited debates um, uh, some of the time between our library and um, the project um, as well. It's not uncomplicated. In terms of the um, uh, ambitions going forward, could we get the last slide, Tanya? We um, 
have, we are advertising to he you here some of the um, websites that exist. So you see already that we are occupying a lot of different um, URLs. And I think this is part of the mix as well. As um, um, Dean Cohen mentioned before, collaboration is not simple. And yet collaboration is also important, but we are, have really settled on a model where also there are what we've called sometimes incubators where there's different projects that are um, associated with reckonings that are led by different members of the team. And then at the same time, it, an emphasis on common um, learning. And again, our RAs are really showing a lot of flexibility being with us um, on this journey. One of the um, things that is um, designed to uh, help with scaling of these approaches is a summer institute for which the call for proposals is going to come soon. It will really be designed in order to work with um, um, instructors around the New England region who have an interest in modeling their own work with community organizations and to common learning in that context. And um, again, um, we really think that um, more of this work that is so necessary of highlighting voices that have been historically underrepresented can be done if we as institutions of higher learning commit ourselves to responsible work in research, but also carry that research work into the classroom. And again, this research work in um, these complex interactions um, with communities as well. So we look forward towards that institute we will also make a um, play with um, Maryland for an implementation grant. And in that context, we, are, um, we have started um, to talk um, more with colleagues by Nicole, more with colleagues like Oli Ayers in London, but also with colleagues in Mills. And more generally, would really like to think about what it would take um, to have a national and ultimately international network um, around such approaches. And at the same time, to perhaps also work on a platform that would actually make such work more retrievable, which relates to all kinds of questions of platforms, of metadata, and other important questions that are coming up um, in the archiving world, um, have been coming up for a while, but that really still need um, different answers because it still remains too hard to get impor important information. Not enough is out there. In other words, the more history making is needed um, and then that history need, making needs to also be more accessible. And I'm just wondering whether we could say Dan, Angel, and Cabrera, whether you each wanted to say a sentence or two. And then I think we could all line up here because that way we could all answer the question together. <laughs> um, I, for my two sentences, I'll say that I think the scaling thing is actually going to be probably the, the sort of final frontier of the challenges of the project. We know that these. Um, these pilots um, are, are really promising. Um, I think there's some really interesting aspects of the division of labor actually within them. Of, I think that, for instance, the library does really well. Scholars and students do well. Community members need to be um, doing and rather than all of us. Um, and so figuring out that division of labor and then scaling it so you can actually um, approach neighborhood or even better have the neighborhood approach us to say, hey, we'd like to replicate this thing, how do we go about doing that and be able to really hand that off to them to give them full agency while also perhaps providing a backdrop of say preserving materials or putting materials online in a way that community might not have access to. So I think that down the road is a really key element of that community that we have to have that. Yeah, I think this this idea of networking at the local level in New England, I think Radon and I have talked about how difficult it is build a network. Um, and so that's one of the challenges. And we're looking forward to seeing how that's going to be possible. And I think uh, for scholars of color, Nicole has been working really hard to do that kind of work and, and to sustain something like that. And you, so how could we do that? And how do we do that also at the community sort of grassroots level around these particular issues? We'll see. But it's definitely something we, we'd like to move forward. I would just say that we're um, committed to listening to our community partners. So um, we have ideas as scholars, but at least if we're going to Black Church, Trail makes sense of New New Hampshire. I'm always very interested in what projects they want to pursue. So they're very much interested in a public history tour for children. Um, because New Hampshire, as you know, is part of that judicial concept law, they, they pass that there. So it's very difficult for teachers in the classroom to teach this history. 
So the Black Heritage Trail, their role is now teaching this history through tours. So that's something that we can do in reckoning. So we can have our public history graduate students help design tours for children. So we're very committed to listening from, to our community partners and learning. I think the floor is open for questions. Uh, Dr. Nieva, can you address the chaperone assistance as well? And I think um, if you don't mind, we could just uh, move away from the slide sharing here. We can see more people. And if you each could introduce yourselves, Regine. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Regine Jean Charles. I'm director of Africana Studies and Dean's Professor of Culture and Social Justice. Uh, my question, thank you so much. I love this project. I think it's so important. Um, uh, my question is uh, for Angel with regards to, and Jordan, I suppose, also for, with regards to the class in the spring. I wanted to know how is it going to be different from what you did in the fall? Are you adding more artists? Are they deepening with the artists? Are the new group of students going to work with those same artists and deepen? And then I also wondered if you, you know, I, I was fascinated by your point with regards to the Black artist movement in Boston not being well documented. And, you know, Wally's just opened back up. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was wondering, like, I wonder if you all are also working with institutions, right? Because a place like Wally's is an institution, right, in Boston that has a lot of that Black Boston history of musicians in the city um, and laid the foundation, right, also for yeah. other musicians. Yeah, thanks. Great questions. Um, one of the things uh, Doreen and I are committed to is continuing to work with the eight elders we've already started with. We haven't quite figured out how we're going to get them to work with the eight new group of elders that we want to work with. And this is something Gija is going to help us to sort of figure out what, what that sort of mix is going to look like. Uh, and bringing in an institution is going to be really important. We haven't thought about that necessarily either because of the way in which <clears throat> this is about the community members telling us what they want and how they want to sort of proceed. I think they would be all in for bringing in institutions and I mentioned several institutions locally that mm -hmm. they'd like to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting is we went to a gallery opening um, at the end of last semester uh, and it was clear that galleries are also a space that we need to think about incorporating into this kind of world that we're, we're trying to document and also trying to expose. Because interestingly, the galleries played a huge part in that. So space is an important part of that narrative. But again, we need to sort of see what the elders want to do because so much of the work hasn't been documented on their end and how the institutions fit into that puzzle is part of what we're trying to figure out and, and sort of let them bring that out. That, that's, that's kind of a, careful dance we're trying to figure out. I'm not evading your question. I'm just, it, it's just part of, you know, putting the agency on them to tell us, and then we can proceed like how, how we move forward. And how did you select the eight more? We haven't selected the eight more okay. just yet. Okay. What will that process be like? You're looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I know I am looking at you. Um, so it's really from my relationship with with a lot of the community uh, artists. Um, so I have no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, Jackie has so graciously recommended some artists. And then of course, there are also more artists that I know in the community that I think should be highlighted and brought into conversation. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, um, this is so exciting and rich. Thank you for this. Um, I, uh, I have I do have a question I wanted to ask Jan, but um I, I wonder if you're also working with the doing the humanities consortium, especially University of Connecticut, that they have, you know, some of the state students that some students that suggest that um, we haven't done that yet, but I do think we uh, as part of this call for proposals, we will draw on the links that you built uh, initially. Um because yeah. they I think that would that, you know if you're looking at New England. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of a uh, relationship, then they are very committed to BICOG uh, research. So um, that's just that suggestion. But Dana, you piqued my interest when you said that um, that there is concerns about the proper uses of the material and the um, and that community uses that hadn't predicted and that that's complicated. So I wondered 
what um what's been complicated about it and where where there are sort of issues of what's proper. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, just on a general level, I think you know, then there's there's good literature in this and in history. Um, you know, the general public approaches history in a very different way than, than we do as historians, right? Um, you know, we have all kinds of theoretical frameworks around it, and a community may want, um, uh, you know, um, just a different set, right? A set of oral histories, a set of um, in our work in Chinatown. Did a lot of listening. I think that was a key word, and they wanted something very different out of what to preserve, how to present it. All of those things really varied by neighborhood, by community groups. Um, in the documentation of the Harriet Tubman house that we did as part of the BRC, there were actually two competing community groups um, vying for sort of memory of that institution. And I think we often think of like the community as a monolithic thing. There's individuals, there's different nonprofits, there's different community groups. So I think, um, you know, we sort of taking off the, the scholar's hat, and I think Manuel brought this up as well earlier. I think students can be surprised by it. I think we need to be in a way surprised by it and to say that we're gonna follow their lead and is the Harriet Tubman House document both sides and try to be as neutral as we can. Um, so I think there's a lot of things. I mean, we, could, we don't have enough time, I think, here, but to go through that. But I think that that multifaceted aspect of it, um, and even the kinds of materials, just speaking as of now, I'm putting my librarian hat on, the kinds of materials actually that people choose or want to preserve might be different than what we would think would be more the preservation. So I think Rodon and her crew, I mean, they really need to think those things through of what kind of you know documentary evidence or documents or texts broadly construed are those that we would want to, to save um, and what narratives those contribute into. So I think it's a very actually complicated and actually rich area to work in um, to think about it. I think it actually should reset um, what we do as historians. Um, and, and um, you know, change our approaches as well. It should actually affect and change what we do. So I hope that just gives a, a little bit of an, an, an entry point into that. But I think every time we talk to a community group, we hear something new. So and I, I also think we come to this work really from different subject positions. And I think those of us who, um, I mean, maybe I pay this just as someone, you know, who transitioned from one country to the other, but um, is very much read as white here. For me, it has definitely been a learning experience um, to really realize how little trust in institutions of higher ed there is as well. Um, and you know, sometimes we know some aspects of Northeastern particular history and that haunts us. I mean, we don't want to discuss this today, but obviously African-American um, master artist was in the background, I think, during and under um, of your class and you were able to move ahead with Gija and with artists on a constructive project. And you know, I then got to go to a to a launch meeting where there was so much um, appreciation for what uh, Northeastern could also bring um, to the table. But that was not the starting point, um, I think, um, of this work. And so I think um, that's just something that we tend to <coughs> under underappreciate and underestimate overall in the academy. Again, different people have deeper knowledge there than others, but I think it's really something that we all need to learn. I just want that Angel or Cabrera, do you want to comment on Laura's question from your perspective um, as well? I'll, I'll bring up one of the challenges very early in the class that we had, just so one can understand where we started and where we ended up. Um, and we don't have time to really flesh this out, but one of the artists was quite clear um, when we were trying to figure out who would work with the particular artist, um, she said, I don't want to work with white students. And you know, that presents a particular conundrum in the classroom at Northeastern, but it also was a great opportunity for us to talk about challenges, right? That the history of Northeastern has sort of given us and we have to sort of work through that. And we worked through it and it was fine. And we can talk later about ways that I did that, but. You know, it, it, it meant 
uh, being nimble, being flexible, you know, not taking it um, personally at all. It wasn't about me. And also being quite aware of the history of the institution and basically saying, I don't want to rehash the past. I want to sort of move us forward and show you what it is that we can do and try to repair through a better process and see what the outcomes could be. And it was a very different attitude by the end of the semester of that experience and we continue to have these relationships with them. So that's just one example of how, you know, a, a praxis that's very different, a practice that's very different can yield better outcomes. Uh, but that, you know, was kind of a little bump and we, we sort of worked it out, but that's real, right? Those are the, the kind of, um, practices and methodologies you don't find in your textbook, in your <laughs> methods course uh, book too often. So you've got to work it through. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. If anybody from the chat wants to talk, um, say so or raise your hand, we'll recognize um, you for... Um, there is a question. There are questions. Can like Shannon yeah. on it to answer questions, yeah. but it was redundant. Oh, got it. Okay. Laurie's question. Right. Oh, here we go. Oh, wait. Is someone impersonating you? It's Julia. Oh, <laughs> I was wondering. You were requesting to speak. Hi, Julia. Hello. This was so fascinating. Um, could I ask a question? Sure, Julia. Go right ahead. <laughs> One of the things that I think was so uh, striking throughout this is the ways in which this work is seeking antecedents and not necessarily finding them and then seeking to become an antecedent for future work, right? S seeking not to have yet another cycle of we have thought these thoughts, we have developed these things, but no one knows about them and so they'll have to reinvent the wheel next time and i'm i'd love to hear more about what was the where where does one where did where did you look where does one look for the work that has been done on you know these you know good practices um tools that work uh you know toolkit approaches things like that but maybe more importantly um the, the question i care more about is what are the things you're learning about how to promulgate or disseminate results, toolkits, et cetera, so that they are discoverable? In other, in other words, what counts at, or what works as genuine discoverability or genuine expandability or buildability? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think we have dreams around these kinds of things, um, Julia, quite frankly. I will just say that many of the RAs, especially Adam Tomasi and um, Elijah Miller, have contributed also to uh, something that right now just sits in a Google ex um, Google sheet, um, um, sheet, basically, that we have called building blocks, because part of what motivated us was that for Northeast, for, for um, Boston, even with the good work that the Boston Research Center has done, and even with the networks of archives that exist, it's actually not easy to discover um, what already exists. And so we have something that we have not put online yet, where we just have searched out more and more organizations and their web um, presence um, as well. And then, of course, we also have important curatorial projects like um, Nicole Aljo's Early Black Boston Digital Art Almanac, um, which really um, has, um, I think, pioneered so much of the work of curation, work similar, I think, um, uh, Cabrera, to the one that you have done with your students um, as well, and the different uh, modalities. But I would just say my dream is that the digital and the physical can intersect in new ways, Julia, and that as part of, um, of ultimately really uh, creating a network around this that there would be something that is, I mean, you know, the, the parallel that I can come up with right now is probably really questionable, but something that's um, much more visually a, appealing than Wikipedia, uh, but has um, a certain, has some of those functions um, as well, 
but also could have a, a map interface, for example. So my dream would be that you move to a new place and you actually know that there is a network out there where you can click on, on places and can find additional information. But I can tell you, we have actually much more focus right now on our work with our partners than on imagining such a future. And if we further imagine such a future, it will have to be imagined also with our partners. It's not something we will just want to um, cook up um, in the library, in the archive, or in the, in the departments here. Yeah. Um, I'm, my name is Daryl I'm the director of business development for college. I want to echo what Regine um, mentioned. Boston had a very rich history. Um, and Wally's is still one of the, like, it's been there for years, but there were the hi hat and the officers club. There was all of these different places where people can go and enjoy jazz and play jazz um, in Boston. So that's something that we should try to figure out how we can get a whole into. The other question that I had for you is have you done, have you been thinking about doing any work on both the community? Because, um, they have very rich stories um, as well. That, yeah. Good analysis. Good <laughs> That's right. We have long stories to tell. No, no. Stories and um, shorter stories to tell about um, Martha's Vineyard at that point. But Cabria especially has actually done research, um, especially I think on Nantucket as well, right? Um, as part of your work on education. And um, Again, there too, there are the partnership and it's not a simple one. And then scaling for us is also um, not simple. I will say that in Martha's Vineyard, there is now a very strong organization um, that has put on the heritage trail there that has a really good um, digital presence as well. And does what so many of our community partners find really important as well. It involves actually high school age um, um, students in its work as well. And that's very striking. So Mellon is so focused on being an organization that funds higher education. And there's really a lot of value in that because there are so few or, um, foundations who fund, uh, fund the humanities um, in, in higher education. They're particularly interested at the intersections of the arts and the um, humanities, which I just think also for reaching an audience is incredibly powerful. And again, one of the things we want to um, continue um, certainly um, as well. But what's very striking about our partner organization is that they are incredibly interested in reaching school audiences. Mm -hmm. And I think it's partially because they want to get um, to students earlier, but partially because they also hope to reach their parents. And I think that's particularly striking in a context where we have so much craziness around um, critical race theory, where in New Hampshire we have a divisive concept law, right? These kinds of things are not so far from us. Um, and of course, we have militias in um, Massachusetts and various forms of racism um, in, in, um, in public discourse um, and so on um, and so on. But again, this, um, um, this thinking about um, audiences at different ages. Um, which we don't do as much in the academy is clearly a challenge um, that we are um, also um, being asked to work on much more. I'll just say very quickly, Nantucket was one of our forays into working with partner. It was very much a green light to move forward, and then they had some structural issues, so that project didn't move forward. And so we right want to now. return to that at some point, mm -hmm. um, and, and we all set sort of because. It needs um, work um, because of some of the um, racial sort of things that have happened on Nantucket, mm -hmm. racialized things that have happened on Nantucket at, at the Africa meeting house. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely one of our uh, projects that's on the list that we're going to work with. So but we'll talk. Okay. One more quick suggestion. Um, I'm on the academic advisory council of the Jewish Women's Archive. I've been for 25 years, and there's a lot of focus on. Um, materials for women. So I just want to suggest you browse around that website. Sure. They were digital from the onset. They're, they started with a like, like poster project. But I feel like, I mean, I bet there are a million national models of online research, but I don't know. Um, Thank and, you. And, and we also want to say that our uh, focus is not just on African American history per se. You know, we're, we're looking at 
diverse community. So it, it just so happens that our particular expertise sort of lies in African American culture, given the constellation of folks and African sort of culture. But we, we definitely are looking. But it is for BIPOC community. Yes, right? okay. I'm like, just, okay. Yeah, there, okay. <laughs> 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 underscoring that point. I think we need to probably um, let all of you go. Um, thanks for being here. We would certainly be happy to chat some more. And Thank you. Look forward. Thank you for our online guests. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Also, thank, thank you for a great panel. Oh, take them right on them. They have a beautiful question. And then once you've written on them, give them back. Back. you can give them back, put them on your wall, or pick somebody else. <laughs> I can do a draft for the video.